All right. Hello again, everybody, friends, you. How, how's it going? Hope you're having a good day. I'm going to go through our second lecture here. <clears throat> this is about what we call the three dimensions of music. This is a really important lecture today, actually, for the rest of the course. You're going to use the terminology, the vocabulary, and the concepts that we discuss here for everything that you're going to do. Um, the course, if you recall, um, the, the first email I sent out, it talks about the class. The class is mostly um, your grade is determined by your tests. Uh, and then also you have a couple class presentations you're going to be doing where you're presenting about a song and some concert reports. Well, in all of those things, you're going to be using the terminology that we discussed today. So you want to make sure that you're taking really good notes and that you have a firm grasp of uh, what we're talking about today. Often music is broken down into these three elements of melody, harmony, and rhythm. They're thought of as the, the three major pieces. There are other pieces of music we're going to talk about in the next lecture, things like timbre and form. Um, but the three primary dimensions of music that people typically think of are melody, harmony, and rhythm. So we're going to approach each of them separately and talk about them. And I hope uh, you're going to have a good foundation uh, from which to 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 talk about music and to listen to music and to think about music. Um, so I want to, again, make this point that the way the course is structured, you're mostly asked to listen to music. That's most of what you're going to do in this class. Hopefully that sounds like a good thing to you um, compared to writing, you know, a bunch of papers and stuff. But uh, I don't, what we don't want is for you to just listen to music in a, in a superficial way. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the time, if you think about it, when we listen to music, we, we're not really listening to it. We're doing something else. We're kind of half-heartedly paying attention. Um, and so what, again, so much of what we're doing at first here, we did this lecture on the Overtone series. Today we're talking about dimensions of music. We're going to talk about how to listen to music. We're going to talk about the history of music and humans. So much of this is to prepare you for this musical journey we're going to go on and to get you to a place where you're actually listening deeply to the music. And, and also you can talk about it a little bit, which is which is a, a little bit of a separate skill, right? It's one thing to listen to music, and it's another thing to be able to identify the melody and the harmony and the rhythm and to, to use terminology to describe them. So this is a really important couple lectures, and it's preparing us for our, our musical journey that we're going to go on. Um, <clears throat> the, the, I've kind of changed the way I structure this lecture a little bit from when I first started. I first started trying to deal more with the concept of quality, what makes a, a good song, what makes a good piece of music, and you know, logically going from there, well, if you know the piece of music is good and music consists of melody, harmony, and rhythm, either the melody, the harmony, or the rhythm must be good, and how do we define that? And I'm gonna focus less on that. Um, now, just because I don't, I don't think it's as helpful a thought. But, but I just, I do want to make the point here uh, off the bat. I think this is the the point I was trying to make by doing all that. That music doesn't follow uh, that kind of logical thinking. So, in other words, um, here's a good way of saying it. There's a composer we're going to listen to a little bit later on in the in the course. His name is Debussy. French composer from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he said that um, great works of art make the rules. Rules don't make great works of art. Meaning, uh, we'll, we'll come up with all of these guidelines and standards we think you have to do in order to write great music. And then someone will come along and break all those rules and write some great piece of music. And then we change all the rules to what the new person has done. And so the, the basic idea is there really aren't any rules for, for great music writing. The rule is that music has to make you feel something. If it makes you feel something, music at the end of the day, I hope to make this point to you over and over throughout the course, music at the end, end, the end of the day is about communication and it's about emotion. And it's about sharing our experiences together as humans and feeling a little less lonely through through the common experience of music. 
And so if a piece of music makes you feel something, then it is valid and it is true and it is beautiful and it is good. If it doesn't make you feel anything, then uh, either you're not paying attention or it's a bad piece of music. And that's, that's I think, a, a basic way of thinking of it. But the, the important thing to understand is there's no rules. There's no formula. There's no thing we can set up. Uh, we're going to talk uh, um, today, actually, about how the same four chords show up in all of these different songs. Well, I can give you those chords right now. I can tell you those ingredients. And that doesn't mean you're going to write a great song. It, it it's It's more complicated than that. So... It's just a preface. Let's dive in here, though. Um, we got three dimensions to cover, so let's make sure we talk about them each um, and that you understand them each. So first is melody. What is a melody? Well, basic definition, and this will be on the test, by the way, for one of the test questions, what is a melody? A melody is a series of pitches played consecutively, so one after another. So the important thing in distinguishing melody versus harmony is time. If you play one note and then after that, later on in time, you play a second note and then after that, later on in time, you play a third note, you're playing those notes melodically. You're playing a melody. If you play all of those notes at the same time, then we have harmony. So both concepts, melody and harmony, have to do with multiple notes, but melody has to do with notes being played over a span of time. Harmony has to do with notes being played at the same time. Okay? So that's the key distinction there melody is almost always it says often based on scale forms is basically always based on scale forms and scale forms are themselves patterns which are mostly derived from drum roll the overtone series so if we take the overtone series and we condense it down into uh, a, a smaller range so instead of having it spread out over multiple octaves over the piano we bring it all in tight into a close setting, uh, we get scale forms. We get these basic pentatonic scales, eventually major and minor scales. Um, and that becomes the basis of our melodies and our, and our harmonies also. But right now we're talking about melody. Uh, the most common scale forms, I already kind of mentioned this, pentatonic means a five-note scale. Penta, if you think of like pentagram or the pentagon. Uh, means fiveness, so pentatonic means five note scale. Major and minor scales. Uh, if you watch Sound of Music, in do a deer, a female deer, ray, ba 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 ba. When sh when they sing up the scale like that, do re mi fa so la ti do. That's a major scale. Um, minor scales is similar but with a different pattern. If you musician, uh, being a musician helps a little bit in this class. It actually isn't a huge advantage all the time but it does help um you don't need to know exactly what that is just understand it's it's different types of scales it's different types of patterns of pitches generally when we talk about what makes a melody interesting or good we think of it in terms of pitch content meaning we want a variety of different notes right so if we just had the same note over and over again that generally doesn't make a good melody if we're just going you know like Da 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 da. That's just kind of annoying, usually, right? Um, we want contour, meaning uh, contour means shape. So uh, we want logical contour. We don't want like a jumpiness. Generally, we don't want like you know. We generally don't process that as being as beautiful. Um, we want something that kind of logically goes up. And now, if you think of like basic melody, like Mary had a little lamb. It starts off la da dum, it goes down la da dum, then it comes back up da 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 dum, dee 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 da dee 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 da 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 dee dee. So there's a, like a gentle up and downness to the to the to the shape of it. And the other thing we look at is phrase structure. So the way that one part of the melody relates to the next. And I think the most obvious uh, example of good phrase structure that I can think of is uh, this. Just sing sing back to me. Uh, quietly at home make a full out of yourself as you're watching this you're in a coffee shop somewhere surrounded by people i'm going to sing a musical phrase at you and you sing just scream it at the top of your lungs make everyone think you're crazy so uh i'm going to do this bugadum 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 bum bum right and hopefully you sing back bugadum 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 bum bum now i'm going to go again bugadum 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 bum bum and then you sing bugadum bugadum bum bum 
Hopefully, right? So that's that's a great example of really logical phrase structure, and that's that's what we call um, question and answer in, in music. So I kind of start by asking a question, bum 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 bum, and notice it goes up. Uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but we call that the interrogative voice in language. Whenever we ask a question, we tend to go up in, in pitch. And you can almost and and really sometimes uh, people get into this annoying habit where they say everything that way. So in other words, it's like, um, you know, are we having a test today? What time is the movie? I got my nails done. I did all my homework. <laughs> you put everything with this interrogative inflection with, with this ascending pitch that generally connotes a question and generally signifies to an audience that we're asking a question when we ascend at the end of a phrase. So so that's what happens musically. And that phrase I was just singing for you, we have bugadum 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 bum bum, which is answered with a descending ending of the next phrase, bugadum 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 bum bum, right? It goes down. Then the question's restated, bugadum 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 bum bum, and now we have this exciting, really high energy, bugadum bugadum bum bum. You know, it's like, uh, can we get extra credit on the test next week? No, I'm not giving extra credit on the test next week. Please, can we have extra credit? I really need extra credit. Fine, leave me alone. I'll give you extra credit. It's got it's got a, a, a logical sequence to it, um, if you think of it that way. Okay, now uh, what I like to do, here's here's a link if you're interested of some someone put together a list of quote-unquote great melodies, 100 best melodies or whatever. I like to think of the exceptions, though. So um, this is a great piece of music. This is actually one of my favorite pieces of music of all time. This is Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, and this is specifically the second movement. I want you to listen and see if you can uh, identify the melody, and then we'll talk about why it's an interesting melody to talk about here. Oh, hold on. I forgot to plug in my computer to my soundboard. I'm running all this. I'm, I'm, I'm going so out for you, all out for you guys here. I've got my computer running through a soundboard, and I'm talking to you through a microphone. You don't care at all, I know, but it's just so you can hear stuff better. Here we go.
we're going to stop it there. Uh, that's about a little less than halfway through the movement. That's my uh, man crush in here, Leonard Bernstein, conducting. Again, you're going to get to know him throughout the course. So if we go back to the, the beginning of this for a second, though, the melody is really simple. So it's going lum, bum, 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 bum. Bum 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 bum. That basically violates all the rules we just talked about here a couple slides ago. We talked about how we want interesting pitch content. Okay, well, it's basically repeating the same notes over and over again. Contour, again, because it's repeating, there's very little shape. Phrase structure, again, because of the repetition, there's there's hardly any phrase structure. But th this is, again, an example of how a great composer can take a really simple set of ingredients and make something amazing out of it. So that's the melody. And then he starts layering um, new ideas and, and counter melodies and, and all kinds of other stuff on top of it until it becomes this giant emotional thing. Um, but it's just a great example of someone breaking the rules and ma writing a great piece of music. In case you're uh, someone who reads music, there's the actual sheet music. Not very interesting, right? Okay. So uh, we must conclude, therefore, the piece of music can be great even if the melody does not conventional, does not follow conventional protocols to what constitutes a good melody. So a piece of music can be good with a bad melody and um, a melody can be interesting without following the rules of what we typically think of as a good melody but uh melody is the thing that here, here's a, a, a shortcut definition for you how to think of melody melody is the part of the song that you walk away whistling or singing down the hallway um so when you listen to a song and it gets stuck in your head and you're singing it the part you're singing or humming or whistling uh, is generally the melody. So that's a good way of thinking of it. And then the official definition we said is is a, a series of notes played consecutively. Okay, so make sure you remember that. Let's talk about harmony. <clears throat> we already distinguished between harmony and melody yeah, in, in terms of time. So when you play notes at the same time, two or more notes simultaneously, you get harmony. When you play them consecutively, you get melody. It's important for you to understand that uh, this class is mostly focused on Western art music over the last couple thousand years. Uh, Western music for the last, since about 1500, so what is that? That's 600 years almost, something like that. I'm not a math major, obviously. Um, has been obsessed with harmony. The, of the three dimensions of music, um, different cultures at different times focus on different aspects of music so um for instance uh folk music is often really focused on melody uh there's a really sophisticated percussion um drumming culture in india in the subcontinent of india and they have an insanely sophisticated rhythmic language i mean to the point that just makes what we do look really really simple <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, but in Western music, we have m mostly been focusing on harmony for the last 500 years or so. Um, and harmonies have gotten in increasingly more complex over the last 500 years, generally speaking. We have uh, what we call tertian harmony, which means it's harmony built on thirds, the interval of the third. Um, you don't really need to know that but it's just kind of an interesting thing to understand we analyze harmony using a roman numeral system based on the scale degree so if we have a scale again if you think of sound of music do a deer a female do re oh, da, da, da. we have do re mi fa so la ti do or if we were to renumber those one two three four five six seven eight we then um when we build chords on top of those notes, so if we build a chord on top of scale degree one, we call that a one chord. Then we use a Roman numeral one to signify it. So that's kind of how we label things. 
Um, <clears throat> harmony can be analyzed in a number of ways, but in general, uh, harmonies which contain a variety of chords and other devices are preferable. So kind of like before, we're looking for variety, right? Um, when we talked about melodies, we want a variety of notes. Harmonies, similarly, we generally want some some variety. We want some different chords. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to skip over this. Uh, this this goes into an interesting piece of music we're going to listen to later on in the in the um, semester, and it's just making the point. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. It's making the point that um, harm, harmony. At the end of the day, here here's how I think. Sorry, that was loud. I thought, yeah, I put it here. Okay, good. Uh, here's here's how I want you to think of harmony. This first bullet point here a good way to think of harmony is simply tension and release i think that's the best way of trying to understand harmony you'll feel when you're listening to a piece of music that uh the the tension level is getting higher you think of like i think probably the most stupid and obvious example of this that you probably know is like think of like a piece of of edm or, or like dance music right as it's getting to the drop right it's like it's ascending it's ascending it's and there's this sense of tension being heightened. And then right at that moment of maximum tension, there's usually like a little break, right? It'll be like... Dur, 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 dur. <laughs> and then the, the big drop comes in. I'm an idiot, sorry. I know, but hopefully you get my point. Um, at that moment of maximum tension uh, is when the drop is the most satisfying. And so there's there's that relationship in music between tension and release and uh, that piece i was going to show you before tristan and his old this is a famous piece because he creates so much ambiguity that it creates constant tension even when it releases there's still a sense of tension and um it it creates it what people either experience as a very frustrating uh, experience or an incredibly fulfilling experience when it finally resolves in a major way so um, I think that's the the basic way of thinking about um, harmony. Let's think of it as tension and release. Okay, so um, here is a an interesting video for you. This is a, a Australian comedy trio, and they are going to show you how the same basic ingredients, the same four chords, are used to write tons and tons and tons of different songs see if you can follow good evening ladies and gentlemen i'm jordan i'm lee and i'm we Penny. are I'm the, the axis, axis of awesome. awesome and i'm benny yeah, we've been a comedy rock band for close to 40 years now mm. and, and all that time we've never had a hit and yeah, I'll just yeah but you guys know why it's Why? Because we never wrote a four chord song. What do you, what do you, what's that? What's a four chord song, Benny? Well, if you want all the greatest hits from the past 40 years, just use four chords. Same four chords for every song. It's dead simple to write a pop hit. Just four? Yeah, 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 these four. Hit. One, two, three, four chords. Sorry, let That's me get this straight, Chicken Little. Um, <laughs> what, you're, um, what you're trying to say is you can, you can take those four chords, repeat them, and pump out every pop song ever. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Fuck off. Yeah, fuck off, Chicken Little. Just listen. Do you recognize this? Uh, yeah, that is Don't Stop Believing by Journey. It's a great song. Very original. There's a few more that fit. Check it out. My life is brilliant. My love is pure. I saw an angel of that I'm sure. Well, that's just two songs that are similar. That's Forever not young. Three I want to be forever young. I won't. Hesitate no more, no more. It cannot wait. I'm yours. This is the way you left me. I'm not pretending. No love, no hope, no glory, no happy ending. Cause you were amazing. We did amazing things. If I
When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. Sometimes I feel like I don't have a partner. That's the way it's gonna be. Jolly Swagman can't buy another ball. Take on me when I come around. Take me on when I come around. I'll be gone when you take. Say it tonight. Gotta take a lot to drag me away from you. There's nothing that a hundred men. That sound familiar? Doesn't that hit too close to home? Doesn't that make you shiver the way that things have gone? And doesn't that seem peculiar? Cause everyone wants a little more. It's something I do remember to never go this far. That's all it takes to be a star. <clears throat> so, we can see here. They use the same four chords for, for all of these different songs. Uh, here's an analogy I like to use to, to think of this. Um, bread. How do we make bread? What are the ingredients of bread? You need flour. Uh, by the way, I'm, I don't really know this. I'm, I'm mostly making this up. Flour, water, salt, and yeast, I believe, you need to make bread. Right? Well, you could give me... Those four ingredients. You can give me the best flour, the best water, the best salt, the best yeast. And I guarantee you what I would make would be inedible. It would taste terrible. No one would want it, right? However, you give those same four ingredients to a brilliant baker, and they will make something just absolutely delicious that you can't stop eating, right? Think, think of it the same way. We can take those four chords, give them to John Lennon, and he writes, uh, let it be. You take those four chords, you give it to, you know, someone who doesn't know what they're doing, and they write something terrible. So, yes, it's the same four chords, but um, it's not just those four chords. It takes more than that. It takes, it takes, it takes intuition. It takes something else. It takes some X factor. Uh, and then it is important to understand that those four chords are derived from the overtone series uh if you remember when leonard bernstein was at the piano and he was breaking down uh the importance of the first two overtones going between he was going between c and g and he talked about how we have tonic dominant relationship one to five relationship that's essentially the core of those four chords so you, it starts off with one to five and then essentially think of it as like the inverse of those and so then it goes six to four and then it repeats um, so if you want, hey, if you want to to pluck this out on your own on a piano, if you go from C major, which are the notes C E G, 
to G major, which the notes G B D, to A minor A C E, to F major F A C. You get those four chords. So C major, G major, A minor, F major. That'll get you the four chords, and you can do it on your own. So again, think of harmony in terms of tension and release. Okay, and then the the technical definition is multiple notes played at the same time. Got la one last uh, element to cover here, rhythm. Rhythm is the duration of sound, so how long sound lasts. Fundamentally, this is kind of a cool idea. I, I, f I find this idea pretty cool. Uh, fundamentally, any particular rhythm is either duple, meaning two-based, triple, meaning three-based, or some combination of both. So really, there are only two rhythms in the world, and then uh, we combine those and speed them up or slow them down to create every other, uh, every rhythm that we've ever heard or played. That's kind of a really cool concept, I think, actually. We organize rhythm into meter. Uh, so um, a rhythm, let's take a song like, um, maybe people would know, I don't know, let's take like, you know, do you know the song Iron Man where it goes, so the rhythm is literally the notes that I'm singing. But we organize that into meter. So we would organize that into beats and then into measures. So we think of it as one, two, three, and four. One E and a two E and a three and four. So we're thinking one, two, three, four. We, it's That's the most common meter, by the way. We call that simple quadruple meter, uh, which is actually the whole point of what, what I'm trying to explain to you here. So we call it simple meter because each of those beats, one, two, three, four, is being divided into groups of two. So if you think of the rhythm, it's going bow, 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 bow. The third beat there, one, two, three, and four. It's going three and that's two uh, even subdivisions of that third beat. One, two, three, and four. So because it's being divided into groups of two, or if you think of the next bar, one E and a two E and a three and four, it's... Uh, the first two beats are being divided into four notes per beat. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So one, a boom, boom, three and four. One E and a two E and a three and four. In that second bar, one E and a, one E and a, that's four notes. So again, that's divisible by two. So because it's a two-based rhythm, we call it a simple meter because the beats are being divided into twos. Uh, that is the more common uh, one, the more common meter, as opposed to a compound meter is when the beats being divided into groups of threes. I'll show you examples of that in a second. And then we call it simple quadruple because there are four of those beats in a pattern. So again, one, two, three, and four, one E and a two E and a three and four, one, two, three, and four. So that's how we think of meter. I uh, pulled some videos to help you with this. So this first video is going to break down the difference between simple and compound. So there'll be a steady beat. You can hear the beat going there. Right now it's being broken up into groups of two, right? One, two, one, two, one, two, one. So it's simple. Now it's being broken into groups of three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So it's compound now. The beat hasn't changed, but the division of the beat changes. Back to simple. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Simple, 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 simple. Now it's going to go to compound. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Back to simple. Pound. Don't mess up. One, two, 
to stop it there. Um, so hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, simple versus compound. Simple, we're dividing the beat into groups of two. Compound, we're dividing it into groups of three. Now, uh, this one is going to show you the difference between triple and quadruple meters. So how many beats there are in a measure. So quadruple meter versus triple meter. It's going to start with fours. So these are songs with four beats per measure. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped. So these are triple now, these are threes. Cause just you and me and all other people, nothing to do, nothing to lose, and dance you. So there you have some examples of songs in triple meter versus quadruple meter because compound. So, so you should know simple quadruple is by far the most common meter type. So when you're listening to music and you're not sure and you, and you need to take a guess, uh, the best guess is, is always simple quadruple. However, um, if you listen carefully, what you're trying to, to determine is find the beat first of all. So find the thing you would like dance to. And then is that beat being divided into groups of two or three when they sing or when you find the melody or, or if you listen to the drums, a lot of times that'll help too. If it's being divided into groups of twos, then that's simple. If it's being divided into groups of threes, then it's compound. Then once you know that, then you're going to listen to how many beats it feels like there is before the pattern repeats. Um, so because compound songs are much less common, I put this one in. So this is an example of uh, compound quadruple and the beat is one, two, three, four. Say something, I'm giving up on you. I'll be the one if you want me to. stumble and fall I'm still learning to love just starting to crawl say something I'm giving up on you I'm sorry
So <clears throat> the compound thing is most obvious when they get to the chorus right here. Say something. One, two, three. 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 So that's, um, like I said, those songs are less um, common. And so I wanted to make sure you had an example of that. Okay, I think that's all we got here. Um, you should know that uh, you want to be able to define all three of those elements, melody, harmony, and rhythm. And uh, you want to be able to describe the music you're listening to and start to practice just listening to people. Normally what I would do at this point with the class, if we had a, a group of people, is I would have, uh, I would say someone come up and play a song that you've been listening to, just come up and they play it. And I would help the class identify, okay, here's the melody, here's the harmony, here's the rhythm. Um, start, start to get comfortable using those terms and identifying those things, okay? There's lecture number two, my friends. If you have any questions, you're going to want to make sure that you submit them for the meetup session on Thursday this week. And uh, hope you have a great day.